Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this caricaturized German Type 7 C U-boat. The model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, I often mention these videos I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 1 35th scale and 1 6th scale. Generally, this primarily focuses on armor models, this being a submarine, that's not necessarily my typical working type medium, but regardless, if anyone is interested in having me work on any sort of project, I can be reached by the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. The model that you see here is built predominantly out of the box, however, I went ahead and made some slight modifications, bringing the model up to the condition that we have here. In this video, I'll be going over these modifications as well as other aspects of the model to watch out for. In addition to that, I will be giving this model a thorough in-box review. So stay tuned because there is going to be a bit of content coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vessel here is the ubiquitous German Type 7 C U-boat. Or at least that's what it's supposed to be. What it is, it's actually a caricaturized, cartoonified version of the German Type 7 C. And in case anyone's wondering, well, that's great, but what's that doing on this channel? Uh, well, this video was uploaded on none other than April 1st, 2023, which makes this video here part of ECA's tradition of posting caricaturized models on April Fool's Day. All kidding aside, the Type 7 is a very influential submarine design and was actually the backbone of the German Kriegsmarine submarine force during World War II. The submarines were more than a problem for the Royal Navy to deal with and was part of the problem that the United Kingdom had and the Allies had during the early portion of the war, specifically with getting supplies to England as well as also to other locations in Europe. The Type 7 itself is just a traditional diesel electric submarine. However, one thing that was interesting about the Type 7 was that it was a boat that was very easily mass produced. And because of that, the Germans actually produced a good number of them. On top of that, the boat was also very adaptable. And as the war went on, many new technologies were added to the Type 7 to try to keep it as relevant as possible. This would be things such as the snorkel, as well as also other designs of cigarette decks so that they could put more anti-aircraft armament on because at this point in the war that was really becoming a problem. The submarine for armament utilized four torpedo tubes in the bow and a single one in the stern. It also had a deck gun and an anti-aircraft gun for surface protection. As the war went on though this layoff would change with the top armament due to the greater threat being from anti-air as opposed to engaging another enemy ship. Really the biggest hurdle or I should say the shortcoming that the Type 7 had was its size. This was more or less a coastal type submarine and it did not have nearly enough range to go across the Atlantic to the United States. For this, they had to design a new submarine which had more range and power known as the Type 9, but that's, you know, a topic for another video for another day. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this Meng caricaturized World War Tunes. Well, <laughs> sorry about that. This is not a World War Tunes model. As anyone who's a frequent fan of the channel will know that every April 1st I build a range of models from the Meng World War Tunes lineup, which is video game merchandise, and it features plastic tank World War II model kits that are caricaturized versions of their real counterparts. Well, Meng is the producer of those kits and have been making them now for about five or six years or so. And I presume those kits must be really popular because not only for a while Meng was constantly releasing new kits in the lineup, but Meng decided to spread out from just that video game merch setup. And that is what we have over here. Along with the World War II stuff, Meng released a range of warship kits known as Warship Builder. It's also noteworthy to point out they did the same thing with airplanes and from what I've seen on the side of World War II's tank boxes, they have things like a Lancaster bomber and a few other examples of planes that escape me at the moment. However, recently they went ahead and started to go into submarines and the model that we have here is quite obviously a German U-boat, specifically a Type 7. 
This mall here is a really hot off the press addition to the stash. Well, that's not really true because this is not an addition to my stash. This was an addition to my father's stash. My dad found this kit online uh, from some retailer, the name escapes me at the moment, and he went ahead and purchased it because, you know, he thought it was pretty cool. Well, he saw that I was doing a lot of the World War II's models because, you know, it's this time of year, I usually build a lot of them, and this model came in and he said, hey, John, you want, if you mind, you know, throwing this kit up together for me? Knowing my father, he's one of those type of guys I'll start four or five projects and either finish one, if that, or the other ones just are partially assembled and just sit in the stash collecting more dust. I figured, you know what, since it's basically in the same skies of the tank kits and basically has the same complexity as the tank kits, sure, I could easily squeeze it into my schedule and, you know, take care of it for him. So, here we have the model right here. Just like with the tanks, these ship kits here are known to be really, really easy and builder friendly. So, it's going to be interesting to see how that transitions over into the ship lineup as opposed to what I typically mention and talk about with their tank kits. So starting with the box art, as you can see, it is very different compared to the World War II tank counterparts. First, like I said before, this has nothing to do with the video game, so there's going to be no merchandise or video game logos anywhere on the box. The graphic design is also extremely different. Here we have a illustration of a stylized German Type 7 U-boat underwater, slipping away in the baffles and we of course have some fish and again just like with the World War II's box arts the illustration itself is nicely rendered. On this side over here we have the Meng Model Company logo along with some other information. We have a cool little blueprint diagram over here in this little swish along with the the vessel's name and on the bottom corner here we have the kit number which is WB-003. From the main box art takes to the side panels, and here we have, which is quite typical on basically all plastic molecules, we have a, an abbreviated thumbnail of the same illustration that's on the front, same graphic design that was also touched upon on the front, while on the side panel over here, we have a cool little side profile image of what the submarine looks like, along with some other corporate info. On the reverse side, we have a little advert for the AK paints, which is something that has been touched upon on the other World War II's model kits before. And we also have a little thumbnail here of the different options that are offered with this kit. What's really cool is that you have the option to mark this U-boat as several other famous U-boats that are known throughout history. What's also really interesting is that even the insignias themselves, even though they're based on actual boats, are stylized as is the rest of the submarine, which is a, a cool little touch that is present with this model. Okay, so with that out of the way, it's time to open up the box. And one thing that, that immediately jumps out at me compared to the World War II's models is that although these ones here are side open, we're gonna need that, while the tanks are side opening, the submarine over here is a traditional top open box. And here we have the parts in question. Similar to the tank kits, the majority of the components are sealed in one integral plastic bag, although unlike the tank kits, the other paperwork that we have here is separately bagged. As for the parts themselves, they're all made from injection molded plastic, but obviously unlike the tanks where you have those flexible track sections for a submarine here, that's obviously not necessary. With the bag opened up, I could dump the parts onto the table. Okay, so starting with the upper portion of the hull, you can see that one interesting feature that this kit has is that the upper hull is actually cut at the waterline. Now, I'm not sure if this was done so you could build the model as a waterline model, or if it was done this way because if you notice, the lower hull is molded with a different type of plastic. Why I think they did this was to simplify the model where if you're a beginner and you don't have any sort of painting equipment or even just the skills, required, you know, to paint models. By rendering it with these two different colors, you could build the models completely out of the box and not have to worry about painting them. So you can see that you can just build the model like this and the 
ballast tank over here will be a separate color compared to the upper hull, which is exactly how it was laid out before in the illustration. However, for this build, of course, I'm going to be painting and weathering it, so that's something that's not really necessary or that, in, or that relevant, but it is an interesting thing to point out. Also, you can see the same thing is true for the deck. The deck on these submarines generally are a different color from the side sections over here for one reason or another. But back to the first runner, which was the upper hull, you can see that just like with the World War II's tank kits, the quality on the molded in components are very nicely rendered, even though the model itself is a caricaturized simplistic type build. But if I zoom in here, you can hopefully see the model is actually riveted, which is something that's really nicely done. I mean, the only other riveted U-boat that's out there is the 172nd and I believe even the 144 scale kit from Revell, which is a topic for another channel really. But needless to say, it's actually really appreciated that they went ahead and molded in those details. Here we have the main carriage for the deck armament. Of course, it's a U-boat, so you're gonna have a really rad looking net cutter right there on the front. There's another one molded into the hull I saw it before real quick, but here we have some side rails, which is again, really nicely engineered because generally these are something that have to be made out of photo etch on some other builds out there. So the fact that they went ahead and molded it in with this format here, it's, it definitely shows some creativity with the mold making process. The next runner is just internal bulkheads. This is something that is seen on several of the other World War II's tanks where with the way the multi-hull or turret assemblies sometimes go together, you need an inner frame. And this kit here basically features that in order to jig up the layout here for the upper hull. Which again, it, from judging by the other World War II's models and the other main character models that I've done in the past, this is something that always comes in handy and is also very well engineered. The last light gray component is the conning tower, which is a single molding, and that's obviously fantastic because this really cuts down on the amount of work required in order to build one of these. I also really like the cool cage setup they have for the runner. It's kind of cool, but the quality of the piece is also nicely done. I'm not seeing any rivets. Nope, no, it appears there are some ri Yep, there is riveting found on the tower over here along with that large handrail that's found on the side and they went ahead and even molded in that really cool horseshoe shaped life preserver which is an iconic bit of detailing found on U-boats. Cigarette deck is also rendered as is all the limber holes found on the top portion of the conning tower. The next runner is the lower hull and like I mentioned before it's molded in this dark gray plastic but you can also see several of the details molded in and they went all out with this thing. Not only do you have some riveting details but you also have some weld line details which of course is true for the real boat and they went ahead and even molded in all of the drainage holes found on the lower portion of the hull and the lower portions of the ballast tanks. Excellently done overall. On the main deck you can see they went ahead and molded in those little oval slats that are found again just part and parcel for a German U-boat specifically a Type 7 and here we have the two propellers right over there. The anchor is present along with several other components for the main deck armament. We have some dive plane guards, prop shafts, rudders, bow planes, everything you need in order to totally flesh out the lower portion here of this vessel. One quick thing that I did notice right before I put the runner down is that this little section here is present on both sides and it appears to be a very frail molded piece of plastic. If you look carefully you'll see that there is some damage found on here and I believe it may even be broken. This is something that will probably not survive the deburring process and it's something that's going to have to be repaired by myself during the production of the model. I just wanted to mention that because this is something that someone can easily snip off accidentally or just accidentally lose throughout the duration of the build. So it is something to pay attention to. Of all the components so far, this one appears to be the Achilles heel found on this kit. And again, it is present on both sides. So pay attention if slash when anyone out there watching this either has one of these U-boats in their stash or is about to start working on one.
The last bit of molding we have here is this little black block looking like object, and this is a stand. This is trying to replicate those really cool block stands that you see on a lot of ship models out there. Generally, these would be wood, but obviously for this little simplistic build here, it's a single piece of plastic molding. Uh, this is something I'm not sure if I'm gonna keep or not. Generally, these stands don't really hold the model up or a, a boat or a submarine up very well or at all. And generally, these are always another Achilles heel found on many ship kits out there. You know, you can have a beautiful ship kit, but if your stand is crap, your model's not gonna last very long. A lot of times it'll fall off for one reason or another. So that is a quick little side note to mention about ships and submarines in general. But at least they were kind enough to give you a stand, which is the case for, again, most plastic ship kits on the market. So that's it for the actual components themselves. The other thing takes us to some documentation. Here we have a contest type flyer. Pretty sure this is long past over, but you know, it's just one of those things that you generally find in some model kit boxes. The next thing to mention is the instruction sheet and it's in this like comic book style protector, which is kind of interesting in its own right. Here we have the markings. And I'm not certain, but I think these may be stickers. And if that's the case, that's a huge, huge step backwards from the World War II's lineup. On those models, the markings are actual water slide decals. And if these are stickers, that's probably a real disappointment. Um, but I believe they may be decals. I think they're decals. I'm, I'm, let's put a pin on that. Just, uh, I'm not used to seeing water slide decals on white paper like this. That's generally a, you know, a sticker thing. But, you know, I believe they might be decals. Anyway, so here goes the instruction manual. And this is the first time opening this up, so I have no idea what it's gonna look like. And, okay, so they just took a page literally out of the World War II's tanks lineup. Generally, the World War II's tanks have graphic design like this where you have some really cool CAD drawings and just some overall nice presentation found on the inner sections of the pages. If anyone has seen my other World War II's builds, you'll know exactly what I'm referring to. And this looks, you know, ex the same type of qualities you would see on those other type of instructions. Uh, okay, real quick, I see that they painted the deck brown. Yeah, don't do that. Not on a Type 7. Type 7 decks are made out of metal. And yes, there is a wooden deck found on several examples of a Type 7. However, there's still some debate on whether they're slatted like this or if they're just, you know, wood planks like on an American sub. I'm on the school of the latter. I don't believe that the wooden decks were just little ovals like that. That just seems unnecessary. And yes, these are the Germans we're talking about, but for, you know, by and large, if you're building a U-boat, the deck is should be metal. And I'm pretty sure that after I made that declaration, the comment section is going to be lit up with angry, irritable people telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. So, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and continue with the remainder of this video. So, starting with the model's hull, as we saw before, the hull is comprised of a multi-part assembly, which lends itself for some very nice detailing and also some really good geometry. The one thing to keep in mind is that because of the way the hull is assembled, you do have to pay attention on the orientation on the components. This is very well labeled in the instructions. However, the instructions does have a blind spot, and it's one that someone who's not paying attention and just going through the motions of the build can easily mistake, and this actually happened to none other than yours truly. While I was assembling the hull, there are a few internal structures here that need to be assembled and sandwiched together in order to flesh out the structure required to assemble the remainder of the top deck and the upper fair water section. Unfortunately, these components can be mounted on in reverse, and there's really no clear indication on the instructions or on the plastic parts themselves. So you could be going through the motion of the build, drop the piece in, and the part will actually fit in place. However, You'll notice where things become complicated is when you start installing the remainder of the superstructure and then realize, oh crap, nothing is fitting right. That's because the part is fitted on reverse. This is something that can easily catch someone off guard. And on my build here, I was actually lucky to actually save the whole model because I was able to act quickly. On my builds, as I frequently mentioned, I use super glues to 
assemble the model. And generally this is really good if you screw something up, a few drops of the bonder and the parts can be dislodged and you know you can clean it off and rinse wash literally rinse wash and repeat however because this model here is made out of abs plastic the bonder will not be able to save you the the bonder will actually dissolve the plastic and that is definitely something that's going to cause problems specifically with a model like this where you have all that very nice detailing and rivets and weld lines that are present so for this one here i actually had to take a dremel and eliminate the structures that were actually, or I should say the prongs that everything was plugged into that was holding everything in place. Those were eliminated with a Dremel with a router bit and then I was able to remove the part and install it the proper way. Didn't look very clean, however, I was still able to get the job done and get the thing assembled perfectly. Fortunately, all of that is internal structure, so you're not gonna see it once the model's fully assembled. But again, if you're building this model for the first time around, I cannot stress enough, you wanna test fit these parts first before you commit with the glue. And also, if you're someone that's really, really uh, mishap prone, you want to take a small sharpie or something and maybe put a little F or an arrow or something on the section to indicate the front just so you properly index everything in the, uh, in the appropriate manner. Outside of that little quirk, the remainder of the hull assembly was pretty straightforward. The next bit that was also a little bit tricky was oddly enough because of the super detailed nature of the moldings and this had to do where the upper hull makes contact with the lower hull. At the waterline area, there is a seam that needs to be contended with. And <laughs> normally this is something that's fairly straightforward. You just use some thick super glue or some putty and you sand away, you know, a few layers later, maybe test paint it and boom, you know, the seam is eliminated. However, that's not gonna be that easily done on this model over here because of these very nicely molded rivets that we have present on the molding. Because of these rivets, you are really, really, really gonna have to stay on the ball and do some very pinpoint and surgical body work on these areas. On this model over here, I was able to achieve this by taking masking tape and masking up both the top and bottom portions where the seam is as close as possible where the seam is, I might add. Then I was able to add the red putty. Once the red putty was dry, I peeled off the tape. The reason why you need the tape there, because the red putty can cause collateral damage with the rivets. If the putty goes over the rivets, the rivets toast. You're not gonna get it back and you're not gonna be able to replace it. So the, the masking tape protects the rivets from any sort of collateral damage. Once the putty is removed, you now have a nice thin line here of red putty that needs to be contended with. And this is where you just have to use muscle and power through in order to do the body work. This was done with some sandpaper, some very fine grit sandpaper, and I was able to basically carefully go in there and literally rub each and every little area with the sandpaper. I had to like double or triple fold into it. It's a tiny little like pencil eraser type thing and carefully ee -ee -ee, and finally sand all that down, being careful not to harm any of the detailing around. This was probably the most labor intensive part of literally the entire build. Fortunately, the model is not that big, as you can see right here with my hand. So the length of sanding is not really that, you know, uh, that egregious. However, it is something that is gonna take some time. In fact, this is probably the second area of the build you're gonna need to take the most amount of time with. And once the bodywork is out of the way, this really improves the build immensely. Even with the camera brought in, you can't see where the bodywork was added and you can't see where the two sections of this model were connected. Like I touched upon before, it is definitely the most labor intensive part on this model, but it's definitely one that yields for some excellent results once the bodywork is concluded. Moving down from the waterline takes us to the lower hull details. And now that the model is fully painted and weathered, you really get to appreciate these details more at this point. One thing I really like about this kit was that even though the model is all caricaturized, they really did go out of their way to properly detail it. This model here has all of the free flooding gate details that are present on the lower hull, as well as also the ones here on the bottom portions of the cigar ballast tank. Even the keel has that nice little plate that we have right here with that interesting geometry. The front detailing, like the neck cutter is present and just give the model just so much more extra character. You can see the torpedo tubes and you also have the front bow planes. The front bow planes are made in a such easy format where we have the bow planes, the guard, and even the cable 
guard that's found right over here. These details generally are a multi-part assembly on some other builds or in some builds they don't even have them at all, specifically the cable system. You have to fabricate that yourself. But on this one here, it comes out of the box more or less as a two-piece assembly. You have the flipper, the dive plane right over here, or I should say the bow plane specifically, and then you have the guard, which is one integral part. It's very nicely engineered in that regard. Everything just plugs into place without any sort of fiddling required. The only type of fiddling you do need to pay attention to is just the alignment to make sure everything is on in a square manner. Outside of that, it was a very problem-free install. Moving to the stern of the vessel takes us to the rudders. Also, one thing that is emitted on this model here are the stern planes. Type 7s, just like with Gatos, Ballos, and basically any other submarine under the sun, have a second pair of dive planes in the back known as the stern planes. They are absent on this model. I presume they probably emitted it for a number of reasons. Probably to cut down complexity and also just for the caricaturized nature of the model. Eh, they probably deemed it wasn't necessary. Regardless, those details are missing, but if anyone is inclined, it shouldn't be too hard to fabricate if need be. As for the components here, these are all the stock parts where we have the rudders. These are also, just like with the bow planes, a multi-part assembly where we have these two sections over here. And just like with the planes, you want to make sure they are on in a nice square manner. Also true for the propellers and the propeller shaft. The components here are all stock with the kit. And again, just remove off of the sprue and connect to the appropriate locations on the hull. One bit of detailing that they did include on this model is the rear stern tube, which is right over here, which is a feature found on the Type 7 U-boat. Moving up takes us to the exhaust manifolds for the diesel engine. These are kit supplied and are very nicely rendered out with their geometry. One improvement that I did make though is I drilled them out with a pin vise just to give the model just a little bit of extra detailing. This was very simply done, and once done, it again improves the model compared to leaving them just molded solid. Jumping to the bow of the vessel takes to the anchor. The anchor is very nicely rendered out and the component gives a lot of nice detailing to this section over here and it just fleshes it out, giving it the appropriate look for a Type 7 U-boat. On similar lines, we also have the bow net cutter. This too is a single piece molding. It just drops into place once removed from the sprue. The one bit of detailing that is absent, however, is the wire that we have right over here, or I should say the rigging, which we'll circle back to momentarily. While moving on, the deck takes us to the bow deck gun. Again, nice cartoony bit of detailing. It looks like something you would see on a Bugs Bunny or an old Mickey Mouse cartoon, and it definitely does the part for this component quite nicely. The way you see it here is absolutely stock. No mods or changes were made at all. Continuing further takes us to the sail. Again, a ridiculously simple bit of tooling that gets assembled and then fitted to the model. As well as also you can see the AA gun as well as the periscopes with their fairings. Everything assembles out of the box without any sort of tweaks or mods being necessary outside of just basic sprue cleaning once the piece is snipped off. While I have the model at this point, you can also see the top deck. Like I mentioned before, the Type 7 has an iconic all steel deck with these slit limber holes that are present on the entire length and the model here does render this out very nicely. We'll circle back to that again when I go over the weathering that I used on this model. And this leads us to the rear portion of the stern. This is where I actually added some extra details to this model. On the Type 7 U-boat there is this distinctive pattern of rigging that we have on the top side. It goes from the bow goes around the sail and then it ends right here at the rear portion of the tail. And the rigging here is absent and is not supplied with the model. However, the model does include an interesting feature. On these two sections over here, the Type 7 has these little tripod sections that are cable mounts and this is how the antenna or this cable system really connects to. And although it's not supplied with the model, Interestingly enough, the provisions or the locations for the tripod feet are molded into the top deck. Now, is this something that perhaps they were planning on adding, but at one point in time they decided not to, just to keep the model simplicity? That is, you know, remains to be seen. However, the holes are, or I should say, the indentations are in the appropriate locations. So what I did was with a pin vise with a very small bit, actually the same size as the dimples themselves, I drilled out the three sections on either side. The tripods themselves are fabricated out of lengths of wire that were bent to the following shape. Each tripod is made out of two sections of wire. The first wire is just bent up into a 
upside down V, and that gets plugged in. And then the third one is a support leg, and it gets glued in place, and then carefully gets leaned against the upside down V that I just mentioned. This is done with identical specs to the one on the opposite side. Once you have these in place, you are now ready to add the rigging. For this model over here, the rigging was actually made out of thin floor wire. Now, a lot of people, they use different materials for rigging. Some people use very thin string. Other people use thin nylon, and even other people use like a plastic, it looks almost like fiber optic, but it's not. It's like a fish line. Actually, it is, it's fish line uh, for the same application. And for me, for this one, I went with uh, a metal wire. Rigging is not my strong suit. This is the reason why you'll never ever see me build a model ship or surface ship specifically. So this is literally the first time I've rigged anything. And for this approach, I went with the wire because one, it's easier for me to work with and I have lots of it. So the wire was fastened to the rear section by drilling a small little hole in the back and securing it in place with a small metal sewing pen. The wire runs along both these sides here of the sail making contact with the tripod and then it winds off right here which is a very distinctive feature found on the U-boat's rigging and then it connects to the front where it joins and then it goes all the way to the bow and connects to the neck cutter or when the neck cutter is fitted. When the later boats did not have the neck cutter in place, it just secures somewhere in the front. Regardless, the wire I think came out very well and it has a nice thin shape to it. And that's why I like uh, materials that are not uh, a string. String, specifically like cloth or cotton string, I've seen models done with that uh, material and you could tell they stick out like a sore thumb. The string frays, it's kind of thick. It doesn't really look all that great in my opinion. The, I really prefer uh, either wire like this one over here or the fish line approach where it looks much more to scale and it just looks better and gives you just better uh, end results. The other thing I wanted to add to the rigging are the pulleys or I believe they're insulators if I'm not mistaken on the real U-boat. Keep in mind I'm a tank guy, U-boats aren't exactly my strong suit. So it's either a, I, I believe they are insulators if I'm not mistaken. So anyway, the U-boat does have these distinctive insulators found on the rigging section. And for the model over here, I wanted to give it this bit of detailing and I wanted to keep true with the cartoony nature of this project. So for the, the insulators, I actually used the small little beads that we had left over in the shop from another project from eons ago and instead of having them languish away these were the perfect items to utilize for this application the beads are added in the following locations and this is as per the real u-boats or i should say also from all the models that we have in the shop of type sevens so i carefully measured everything out and the ones on the rear have three of these units present on each side there's four right here on the Y section, and then when they meet here in, this, in the center, there are these other two that you see presently. The beads are a bit chunky in their overall size, however for this application here, they fit the caricature nature of this build, in my opinion, perfectly. And the addition of the rigging really does enhance the model compared to just leaving it naked without the rigging in place. Of course, as I would mention this is the type of thing where if you don't have the skill the technique or even the materials to achieve you might just want to skip it and leave it off and this is specifically true if someone is a novice builder and they don't have any of these skill sets i just mentioned you could just build it without the rigging in place and just you know basically call it a day Swinging back to the periscopes, you can see the details we have here, and these are the stock original units. But the way I painted them was I first paint the units with some spray paint, silver paint, and this gives you the bottom shiny sections. The top sections are painted with the same gray color that I'm going to be mentioning in a moment when I go over the paintwork, but one other tip that I did was I added the little lens detailing that we have right here on the two periscopes. This was just done with a little drop of gloss black paint and once added just gives a little bit extra detailing and a little extra kick to the model without adding a whole bunch of extra effort. And that's really all there is to the detailing and this leads us to the paintwork. For the paintwork on this one here I went with basically what you see on the box art which is a dual tone gray paint scheme which is very commonly seen on boats of this type. So for the darker gray, this is actually Tamiya 
uh, Panzer Gray, while the light color gray is Timia Kerr Gray. Both were applied with the airbrush. First, the entire model is painted with the Panzer Gray. Then I went ahead and masked up the appropriate locations and with some masking tape, and then the Kerr Gray was applied via the airbrush as well. With the way the model is painted, the Kerr Gray is only on the side sections here of the sail, as well as also on the upper portion of the waterline. The entire ballast tank the waterline below, and also the top deck are still in the Tamiya Panzer Gray coloring, which is again as per the examples that I was referencing. With the paintwork out of the way, this was then time to focus on the weathering. And the weathering on this one was very similar to the same type of idea that I utilized on my 172nd scale skipjack submarines that I've posted on this channel in the past. So one thing about boats and submarines in general when it comes to weathering is that a lot of people out there and this is just from a casual observer who occasionally you know sees ship models posted on the internet and also from from going to shows is that a lot of individuals out there they really don't understand how to weather a vessel right a lot of people when they think weathering a naval vessel they just think of one thing and one thing only and that's rust lots of rust and Rust is only one ingredient to weathering a ship, okay? And the funny thing is when I've seen people who weather with rust, they tend to overdo it, and they do it in the most anachronistic locations. Like, I have seen countless models, countless models of every type, submarines, battleships, carriers, you name it, where waterline up, the thing is a complete rust bucket. However, waterline down, completely clean. Like, that... Remember... Guys, uh, this part down is in salt water all the time. Not so much this part, specifically on a World War II submarine. These things were on the surface more often than they were on the water. This is what would get weathered more than the top. So to have the top completely rusty like you know an old tin can, and have the bottom clean, completely anachronistic, and it just it ruins the look of the build. I've seen some what otherwise would be decent builds messed up with this. Another thing that is also absent that a lot of people out there who weather these ships do, is they only do rust and rust alone. Like I said before, rust is just a single ingredient. It's like, you know, making a pizza and the only thing you have on, 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 the, on the, the crust is oregano, okay? <laughs> it's just one ingredient. You need other ingredients to flesh it out. And when, you're, when, the, when the vessel's in the water, you're going to need to have other effects, such as salt effects and also biofouling. I cannot stress this enough. For the boat to be that rusty and have neither the salt or the biofouling, it's just not something that you would see, okay? Those three effects happen simultaneously, generally speaking. And as for the amount of biofouling or even the salt line for the bathtub ring, this also depends on how long the boat's been in the water, where the boat's been in the water. If it's in the North Atlantic, it's going to have different biofouling compared to if it's in the equator. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of thought process needs to go into weathering a vessel. And a lot of people out there, they just don't think about that when they're going through the motions. So with that quasi-tutorial slash rant out of the way, let's go back to how I applied the weathering to this example over here. So first, the... Areas above the waterline are weathered in my usual format, which would include airbrushing for countershading, as well as also for filtering and highlighting. So it has some sun fading effects, some countershading effects, as well as some dripping effects. The model was, this was done to all sections, not just the above the waterline, but also below the waterline as well, had the same exact effects done to it. The Tamiya, Black accent color was very handy in getting into the top deck sections to paint all of those little ovals here, making them pop out compared to just leaving that absent. Also, with the way the model is riveted, the Tamiya accent color really comes into its own and it really makes everything just so much more highlighted compared to before. With a paintbrush, I went ahead and also used some dry brushing techniques to get some paint chipping effects going on the edges and on some other locations. And then for the waterline down, I added some other effects, which was done with both the airbrush as well as also with a little bit of dry brushing. And this is how I was able to get the faded, salty look that we have here on the paint. The way I made this model was that it has been in the water, but not for a super long period of time where you're going to start having things like barnacles and other 
sorts of biofouling occur. However, you can still see that there is some algae here on the bathtub ring, as well as the salt line on the bathtub ring itself. This model also has some rust effects too, which are applied via the paintbrush, and you can see them streaking on certain locations from the fair water around the areas on the water line. Another thing to point out about a submarine is with the limber holes. Each one of these limber holes are painted with a little bit of black paint, and this is done in order to just give the model the appearance of having more depth. Some people out there may try to drill these out with a Dremel and a small router bit. If that's you, you know, rock on. Uh, in my opinion, the holes are on the smaller side, so it's probably not something that's going to be worth it, and it's something that could potentially make the model look rougher and not that uniform, as opposed to just doing the paint wash technique like I did here. But if you want to try that, honestly, I don't recommend it, but if you have the skill for that, you know, yeah, I could see how it definitely would improve the build overall. But it's definitely something that is forbidden fruit, in my opinion. Outside of the weathering effects I just mentioned, keep in mind this is a diesel-powered submarine. These are your diesel exhausts. So a couple little poofs of flat black there with the airbrush were utilized to get the effects that you see on either side. Some other things to mention about the paintwork would be the iconic horseshoe-shaped Life Preserver, which is found on either side of the sail. This is painted in red with a very thin paintbrush, and I believe that these have a multitude of different colors to them depending on the boat in question. This is something that's best done by doing your own research. And of course, at this point here, I'll generally talk about the markings. And this is where, in my opinion, the kit really does fall short for reasons that are more or less just not understood. As we saw before when I did the unboxing, the markings that are supplied with the model are more or less stickers. Not even, not words like decals, but they are stickers. Like something that, you know, you would find on a toy or a Lego or something. And I'm not going to use stickers on my model. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> it's just, stickers are really a, they're not, they're a really low end choice for a uh, marking solution. And the fact that this kit gives you stickers is kind of puzzling to me, specifically since we have other kits that are similar to this, like for instance, the World War II's models, and they give you fantastic quality water slide decals. The fact that this kit gives you stickers is honestly one that's a bit baffling to me, and I don't know why that's the case. And that's why, if you notice on this model here, there are no markings whatsoever. It would have been awesome if they would have had some water slide decals, but for one reason or another, that's just not the case with this model. So I rolled with the model without any sort of markings on it whatsoever. However, although this model does not have any markings on it, I still went ahead and thoroughly coated it with the VMS matte varnish, just so that it seals the paint, protects it, and also that varnish has an excellent way of just making the model look so much better once the varnish is added. It's one of those things where you just have to experience it. After the model's varnish, it just has such a more vibrant color to it, and it just always does the job very well. The very last thing I want to mention is something I may have touched upon before in the unboxing, and that is the stand. This model here is just like what is typically seen on many other ship kits out there, and the kit supplied stand leaves a lot of room for improvement. Actually, I'll just say the kit stand is pretty terrible. There's the kit stand, and the model just sits on it like such. Uh, I'm probably going to make a new stand at some point in time, but for now, actually, it, it works, I guess. You know, it, since the, the Type 7 here has this nice flat section to keel, it just sits on the stand pretty well. But this is definitely the one of the more weaker aspects of the model overall. And, you know, per, I, I guess it's intended for you to glue the model to the stand, which is, that's just not going to happen. Uh, so, yeah, I'm probably going to probably take a lionfish stand or something and, you know, play with that. But for now, it could just sit on this for the time being. It's not going to hurt anybody. But, uh, yeah, if I was to say what is the weakest aspect of this kit, that's, you know, uh, it, or definitely the markings, the stand, and the sections, the, the hull section that I mentioned before. Those are the big three areas to watch out for. But the stand, yeah, it it's definitely falls short in my opinion. I mean, is something like that a complete deal breaker and is the type of thing to say, yeah, this kit's not even worth it because of the stand? <laughs> Absolutely not. The stand is just a stand. You know, you could make do with any other type of a solution. But it is important to mention that it is a kit supply part and it's really eh, something that could have been better thought out. At the end of the day, this is a build that I'm really glad I not only added to my collection, but it's one that I took on to begin with. 
Clearly, this is definitely not something that I typically work on, subject matter-wise speaking. Generally, if you're a fan of the channel, first I want to say thank you, but you know, I usually work on things that are tracked or wheeled, and if it touches the water, it's still going to have tracks or wheels in one shape or form or another. This being a German steel shark, yeah, this is definitely something that I haven't built in many, many years. In fact, last time I even built a U-boat. I think I was like seven or eight years old. So it's been a very long time since I even laid my hands on the hull of one of these type of vessels. And trying my building techniques and my painting techniques on something that's not a land vehicle in any way, shape or form is definitely one that felt very fun to undertake throughout the entire process. And this is the perfect time to slide us into skill level and recommendations. Would this be the type of model I recommend to a beginner? The answer is actually yes, yes it is. With the caveat that you really need to pay attention to the orientation of how the hull gets assembled, this is something that looks are definitely misleading. You could fall into a false sense of security and just go through the motions and next thing you know, you can accidentally install something on in reverse, like I touched upon earlier in the video. This is something that you want to stay on the ball with and you want to test fit a couple of times before you go ahead and commit with the glue. If you go ahead and do that, the remainder of the build will just slide into completion. Outside of that little warning, the remainder of the model is very similar to the World War II kits that are also offered by Mank, which is kind of funny because they're both made by the, literally the same people. Not so much with the lead engineer, but with the way the kit is designed and how it assembles and also with the overall feel and the proportions of everything, it's very World War II-y. So I guess the best way to put it, it's World War II's adjacent. Regardless, that lends itself for ease of simplicity. And these models here go together extremely quickly, extremely easily. And when you're going through the motions and building the model, they're also very, very fun. Of course, outside of the beginner, needless to say, an intermediate to an advanced range individual can tackle one of these models practically blindfolded. Although you still want to pay attention to the hull orientation, like I mentioned before, for the same reasons. But outside of that, yeah, if you have those advanced skill sets, one of these models basically go together by shaking the box. Even though the model is a somewhat simplistic model, it does leave room for a little bit of creativity in aftermarket components. Now, unlike the World War II tanks, I don't think there are any aftermarket parts out there to spice one of these up, as there are with some of the other turned aluminum barrels or other conversion sets that are out there for the World War II's models. So this one here, you're basically just going to be working with the confines of the kit. Fortunately, the Type 7C is a somewhat simplistic boat, but you know, it does have several other additions that one could tool up. Like on this model here, I added the extra rigging lines, but if you are so inclined with 3D printing, you can easily design a brand new tower for this model over here, giving it the extra cigarette deck version or even the version with the snorkel. And that's just the two that, you know, come to my mind. This model does have some adaptability to it. And it'll be really interesting to see if someone out there can actually tool up this model with those other configurations. Regardless, this all lends itself again to the base starter kit being as adaptable as it is. One thing that I was personally impressed with was the level of quality on the moldings with the details that are found on the surface. Even though it is a caricaturized and, you know, whacked out proportions model, it does have essentially the same detail and the same detail fidelity as found on the Revelle Germany Type 7 U-boats in 144 and also in 172 in regards to the weld lines as well as the riveting. All in all, it's actually a really high quality piece with all things considered. And again, all this lends itself to the type of model that would be greatly appreciated by someone that likes to weather and has a lot of painting experiences there. These extra added details will definitely come into handy when it comes time for weathering the model. As I touched upon before, this model is definitely an exercise in paint work. And with these extra details that are integrally molded on, this lends itself to really hi be highlighted in these certain applications. And I believe we just crossed the threshold now into recommendations. So first and foremost, if you are a fan of the World War II's line, this is definitely something to check out. Although it is not at all associated with World War II's, it definitely is, like I stated before, World War II's adjacent, and it fits right into that little universe that we have there. And for instance, right here in my hand, I have the Panzer II, and you can definitely see that they look like that they would be perfect shelf mates paired with one another. Outside of the World War II's fan, if you are just a bubblehead and you absolutely love submarines, 
Needless to say, this kit is definitely recommended for you. Although it's a little bit different compared to something like the Ravel Germany Gato or the Skipjacks or, you know, the other models that are in similar skies, this will definitely be something that would still be appreciated by that type of person who has a collection of model submarines, be it RC or static. Also, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some nut job out there who can actually take one of these things and RC convert it. I, to me, it seems very, very difficult or possibly impossible to do. However, I have been blown away with some of the creativity and some of the engineering prowess out there from several individuals out there on the internet. So if I ever see a video out there of one of these things RC converted, honestly, I probably wouldn't be surprised by it. Would that mean I would recommend this to someone to RC convert? Uh, I just want to say no, it's way too small in my opinion, but again, there are some crazy individuals out there online, and uh, I've seen some crazier things that have been RC converted in the past. On a similar lines, if you're a fan of just the Type 7 C U boat, you know, you have all the Ravel Germany kits, you love the movie Das Boat, this kit here is definitely going to be recommended for you. It just ticks all those boxes, it has the look of the Type 7, and it has the proportions of which, and even though they're all, you know, stretched out and all goofy and everything, you can still easily distinguish that this is a Type 7 CU boat. And if that's something that the creators of this kit were going for, they definitely achieved that with flying colors. Another person I'd recommend this kit to would be just like what I mentioned with the World War II builds, which would be anyone who's a individual who used to build models, but they moved out of the hobby for one reason or another, but they want to re-enter back into the hobby. If this is you, one of these kits over here is a great kit to welcome you back in. It's not overly complicated, it's very nicely detailed, and it's one that'll help you brush up on a lot of your skills that you may be somewhat rusty with. If that's you, one of these kits here would be greatly appreciated. Along similar lines, if you're a youth builder and you're looking to get into the wonderful world of model making, these kits here are another great way to enter into that. They're fairly affordable, they are fairly available, and Picking one up is something that can be built and not be something that can stress you out or be stretching you to your limits, so to speak. Along similar lines, if you are the type of person that are looking to gift a model to someone, either you have a model builder in your life or you know someone who's a real big fan of military history or just history in general, they would greatly appreciate one of these models over here. They are a fantastic way to give as a gift and it's one of those things that will be greatly appreciated and will be greatly enjoyed by the person who would be the recipient be it a youth person or someone who is you know over the age of 35 and build models these individuals would greatly appreciate the addition of one of these kits to their collection the final person i'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who is a parent grandparent or an uncle aunt, you know, anything along those lines, and you're looking to spend some quality time with someone special in your life, be it the nephew, the child, the grandchild, any other type of individual like that, this is the perfect weekend or afternoon project to enjoy with that person. These models are, again, very affordable, they're very easily built, and it's something that can't stress you out, and you can have a nice bonding experience with that individual. It's the type of thing that you'll definitely build memories with, and it's one that will be cherished for years to come. Along similar lines, if you are a youth person and you're looking for something that you can build and actually play with, this is a great model to do so. The parts on here are robust because of the molding being ABS plastic and also with the chunky size of the parts. So this does lend itself for robustness. Now, as I mentioned with the World War II models, if you play with it excessively, you can and will be breaking off some certain small parts here or there. But outside of that, these models are fairly robust and do have some playability to them. And this is the type of thing I could definitely see someone playing with when they're taking a bath. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this caricaturized German Type 7 C U-boat. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build as well as other photographs of the other builds, both small and large scale, that have been seen on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing at by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and vehicle components. As well as don't forget to swing by Iron Bottom Sound Hobby Kits for 172nd scale submarine 
aftermarket detail upgrades. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Take care.